All right, Bono said, that's your boy Big Rich. Good evening. What's poppin'? New York City, Queens. Time for another mob story. Consistency is the key. Let's get down to business. Of course, gentlemen, wipe your feet on the rug. Throw some smoke in the air. American Mafia Murder, The Man in Potter's Field, from GangstersInc.com. Written by Tom L. Jones. There are more than a million buried in this graveyard. There are no stones or memorials to remember them. It's not the biggest cemetery. That's Calvary in the borough of Queens. Salute. This one is different, though. It's the final resting place in America's biggest city for the people no one wants. It is also, aside from Manhattan, the oldest incorporated part of New York bought from the Hunter family for 75000 New York has been burying its unwanted dead since 1869 on this little island in Long Island Sound off the Pelham Bay Beach in the Bronx. It's a mile long and a half a mile wide, about 100 acres, filled with the remains of people who range from street vagrants to a woman who was so rich she was a neighbor of John Lennon in the famous Dakota apartment building overlooking Central Park, and a man who was part of the mafia. In New York, a body not claimed within 48 hours is often offered to medical schools or to organizations that do embalming training. The remains, after use, are then buried in Potter's Field on Hart Island. The island previously administered by the Department of Correction and since December 2019, the Parks Department, was perhaps the only graveyard to use prison labor and sometimes scornfully referred to as a prison for the dead, the largest tax fund pauper's burial place in the world that created a mythos about where the city disappeared its most defenseless. Richard Guija finished up here in 1997. He was lucky in one way. His original grave was a hole in the ground in woodland on Staten Island. That's where he finished up after he was stabbed to death in a barroom brawl on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. He would have stayed there, presumably, indefinitely, except for a man who was exercising his nosy dog one day. Although the body was discovered, no one knew who it was. DNA profiling wasn't available in 1997, but for some reason, he was not used to help identify the remains at that time. However, samples had been taken by the medical examiner office for future reference and stored on the FBI DNA database. He was 41 at the time. He died a low-level hoodlum, operating as an associate in one of the crews in the Bonanno crime family. His killer was Nicholas Piscioti. He had started his mob career as an associate with Lucchese family Princess Street crew headed by Joe Di Palermo, a notorious mafia drug dealer. Along with his younger brothers, Charlie and Pete, he operated his business from a social club next to number 27, which was a pizza shop. Not just any old pie place, but perhaps the most famous in New York, Ray's, owned by Ralphie Cuomo, who was also part of the gang. He opened it in 1959, and although his name was Ralph, he called it Ray's, thinking Ralph was too feminine. After a four-year stint in prison for narcotics trafficking, Piscioti, on his release, transferred to the Bonanno mob family. His uncle, Charlie Musillo, was a capo there and pulled in favors for his nephew, who moved to a crew ran by Big Frank Coppa and was made into the family in December, three months after the killing of Guija. Capo would flip in 2002, Scraciad, and be the first of many in the Bananos to cooperate with the government in exchange for a sentence reduction, including the boss himself, Joseph Massino, the first mafia chief in American mob history to roll over and become part of Team America. At this in 1997, Piscioti was running a bar on 2nd Avenue in East Village in Lower Manhattan called Banditos. It had been a Mexican-style restaurant as early as 1982 when it was owned by a Czech called Rudy Mazzini, who was following the liberation of East Berlin, decided to go back to Europe in 1989. A little cafe under different owners eventually morphed into a bar, and it was here on the evening of September 13th that Richie Guija got into one fight too many in his drug-fueled, cantankerous life. He was, according to one source, a violent, vicious coke user, the most obnoxious scum who ever walked the streets. His mother, Rosanna, loved him, though, and eventually it was her DNA that matched the records the FBI had held all those years. She would, in 2007, be able to have his remains exhumed from Potter's Field and committed to a Christian burial. Piscio and his friend, Michael De Maria, were running the bar that night. Both men were about the same age and had been childhood school friends growing up in Manhattan's Little Italy district. 
They were both drug dealers, extortionists, and thugs. Di Maria would earn his button into the Bonanos the same year Frank Capo rolled over. At the trial of the Bonanno acting boss, Vincent Basquiano, in Brooklyn in July of 2007, Piscioti and Guija got into a brawl in front of Banditos and then came inside to have a drink. But the booze had the opposite effect. Agitated and armed, he soon began slashing at Piscioti and Michael De Maria with a knife, Piscioti said. Richie wound up dropping the knife, Piscioti said. Then he hedged. He wound up dying, the mobster said. When prosecutor Amy Busa asked Piscioti what happened to the knife when it fell, he replied, I picked it up. Anybody seen Richie? When she asked who actually killed Guija, Piscioti said, probably both of us, me and Michael. Piscioti and Di Maria hid the body in the basement of the bar for a couple of days, and then it was taken and buried on Staten Island. Ironically, Rosanna Guija had taught both Piscioti and De Maria when they were children at elementary school. Wow. That Guija was still around in 1997, speaks volumes about how bad the mafia is at what it does. In 1991, while he was serving a prison sentence, he was annoying, he was annoying an ex-girlfriend who was now enamored of one George, Georgie Neck Zapola. He was a close confidant of Anthony Casso, controlling the Lucchese family on behalf of the boss Vittorio Amuso, who was doing a long stretch in prison. Guija became a thorn in their side, and the Lucchese administration decided that he would go for a long drop. Between 1991 and 1993, 31 members and associates of the crime family tried to kill him. They attempted at least 12 times without success. One of the target spots was the basement of Ray's Pizza Place in Prince Street. Somehow he avoided them all. He was either smart or the gangsters were really stupid. Jimmy Bresson wrote a book called The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight, published in 1969, that could well have been a trailer for the comic activities of this bunch of inept killers roaming the streets of New York in search of a target. In Hamlet, Shakespeare tells us, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. Metaphorically, Richie Guija had a regiment after him, but in the end, it was all down to two thugs who were better at their job than he was. Louisa Van Slyke, a 24-year-old orphan, died of tuberculosis in Charity Hospital on Blackwell Island without family or friends to claim her body. She was the first to be buried in Potter's Field in April 1869 an island for the undesirables. Bobby Driscoll, the famous child actor of the 1940s and early 1950s, was buried here after he died drug-addicted, penniless, and unclaimed in March of 1968. In 1985, the first baby to die of AIDS in the city was buried on this island and is the only grave marked by a tombstone. And 35 years later, the bodies at least 100 each month keep coming an endless migration from life to death. Although, as David Bowie once said, the truth is, of course, that there is no journey, we are arriving and departing all at the same time. Potter's Field, New York, is the largest pauper's graveyard in the United States where death of the most anonymous kind shapes a landscape as empty as the moon. Perhaps the only one to ever hold, for 10 years at least, a victim of America's Mafia on the World. Great story, man. Salute. Of course, Shadow always finds the dope stuff. Everybody have a good evening.